though sometimes he don't. He didn't let me do it this time. Uh, he put a message in my heart about Monday. I mean, really as strong as any message I've ever gotten in my life. And uh, what's strange about it, it's not really strange, I guess I don't get surprised anymore. But I went back to the text that I was going to preach from, and I realized it was right where we were going to be anyway. The last place Brother Ronnie preached on Sunday morning was at a 2 Kings chapter 1. Uh, he preached about Ahazi uh, and Elijah. But then he finished out the last part of chapter 1. We're going to pick up in the first part of chapter 2, where we would have been anyway. So God knows what he's doing. That's right. I, I love Easter, and I love taking that time to remember my resurrected Lord. But the truth is, he's alive 364 days out of the year other than that. That's right. He's alive every day. He's alive every Sunday. And so he's alive every Monday through Saturday. I mean, he's alive all the time. Uh, but I don't, I don't disappoint about that Easter message. But y'all pray for me. This is a little out of my comfort zone. Normally, the Lord He gives me what I call shotgun messages. I can just blast away, and, and a lot of people are perhaps going to get stung. You know, I just let the shot fall from where it may. And sometimes He gives me a bullseye about that big, and said, it gives me a sniper rifle, and says, "Hit." It may not help many people, but it may help a few people a lot. Today he's given me the target about the size of a pea and said, I want you to throw a hand grenade at me. So, uh, it's, it's just amazing how the Lord does things. Uh, let's stand. I see, I'll read the first 14 verses just to give us some context. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, it says, It came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elijah, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elijah, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold to your peace. And Elisha said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar all. And they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together, and smoked the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and he ripped it into two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah and fell from him, and went back, and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mail of Elijah that fell from him and smoked the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had spent the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for sending your son to die on Calvary, Lord. We thank you that he rose on the third day, Lord, that we have that hope, God. Would you lift up our pastor, Lord, Miss Vicky, and Chance during this time, Lord, even as the doctors are working on them, God, I pray that that bleeding stop, Lord. God, I pray that he would get help, that the, God, he would be heal of this disease, Lord, and I pray that he'll get back to us uh, and do the work he called him to do. Lord, I pray that this, during this time, Lord, the chemo and the radiation would make him sick. Lord, I pray he'd come through with a fly of Lord, and we'd be able to give you glory for everything, God. I pray if there's anybody lost today, God, the sound of my voice, you'd save them today, God. You'd open their eyes to their need of salvation, God, that they would think on things of eternity. God, I pray that you take what you put in my heart and help me put it in theirs. Move me out of the way, Lord, and thank you and praise you. With the help of the Lord this morning, I want to preach on the subject of what Elijah didn't know. What Elijah didn't know. I love Elijah. He's one of my favorite. 
favorite Bible characters. And one thing I love about Elijah is he had no past. You, if you look at 1 Kings 17, he just appears. And the first mention made of him was that God told him to go prophesy to Ahab that the heavens will be shut up for three years. He had no past. He, he's called Elijah the Tishbite, but there's no, you can't trace where he came from. And what that tells me is heaven is not interested. And God is not interested in the things that we did before we were saved. And I thank God for that. But He is interested in what we do for Him and when we decide to live for Him and, and serve Him. And that's where Elijah picked up at Him. Well, God did some amazing things to this man of God, Elijah. This prophet had, had survived the, brook, the dry brook of chairs. Uh, he had raised the widow's son from the dead. He had called fire down from heaven against the 400 prophets of Baal. Uh, this man had endured hard times. He had seen victories. And now here he is ending uh, his, his life as he knows it is coming to an end. And it's kind of a sad time. He's probably well stricken in age by now. And his health is probably failing him. And he thinks that he's going to die soon. That's apparent from what the sons of the prophets said about him. They said, Elijah, surely the Lord will take your master away from you. And he said, I know. Elijah realized it. Elisha realized it. The sons of the prophets, they all knew it was coming. But he wasn't quite through yet. So what, there's some things here that we can tell from their attitude that Elijah didn't know. And if he hadn't known him, he would have been a lot happier about what was going to happen. And when I look at this passage, it's, it's eerily strange how similar these prophets are to what we're facing today. Elijah reminds me of our pastor right now and what he's going through. Elisha <coughs> reminds me of us and what we're going to have to go through and have to deal with. There's an eerie comparison here in this text that we were going to be here anyway. But I'm going to give you some, a few things that Elijah didn't know this morning. Number one, Elijah, he didn't... He, he wasn't sure about his time on the earth. He didn't know about his time on the earth. And that's apparent from what he says. It says it came to pass when the Lord would take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind. That Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. He left Gilgal. And Gilgal means the circle. It seems that the circle was going to be broken. And he says in verse 2, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. You see, Elijah thought that he was going to Bethel to die. And he didn't want his disciple, he didn't want his young student coming to see that. He wanted to be remembered for who he was. Amen. He thought he was going to Bethel to die. This is a sad moment. I mean, he's, he's coming to what he feels like is into his life as he knows it. And he tells his young disciple to stay here. He wants to go die and cry. He tries to distance himself from those that he loved. And I like what Elisha did. He said, no. He said, wherever you're going, I'm going to. And he thought he was going to Bethel to die, but he didn't go to Bethel to die. God wasn't through him yet. And I love it. We, we talk about Bethel Wednesday night. That's where Jacob was running for his life from his brother Esau. He was going to kill him. And he was trying to make his way to Herod, and that word Herod means mountain dweller. Don't we like to dwell on the mountain? Yeah. Don't we want to be on the mountain top? Yeah. But while he was running for Herod, he stopped at night to camp out. He was in a different place, and a dark place, and a dangerous place, and a dreadful place. Yeah. But God visited him that night. He got to see God in a way he'd never seen him before. And when he woke up from his sleep, he said, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He said, oh, I, I can see. I mean, can't you just see Elijah and Elisha walking through that Bethlehem? Jacob had built an altar there because he said, Surely God is in this place. And Bethel means the house of God. And he built it out there in the wilderness, in his dark place, in his desperate place. And the, the, the story behind that is God will meet you anywhere. You don't have to be in here. God will meet you in your valleys. Hey, He can meet with you in your car driving down the road. He can meet with you at your house. He can meet with you in Little Rock in a bed and with cancer. He can meet you there. He can meet with us here this morning. I thank God He'll meet with us anywhere we want to go. Amen. But you know what I love about this, and I've heard it said so 
many times, and I believe this. God wasn't ready to take Elisha, Elijah because he had to show Elisha. He had to tell him about Bethel. But I'll tell you what, that Bethel was just as much for Elijah. You imagine that old prophet near the end of his life, and, you know, just, just down in the dumps, and I imagine him, him walking with Elisha. I wonder if they saw that altar in Jacobville. So Elisha, you see that altar right there made out of stone? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about it. Got a man named Jacob. And one time he was running for his life, and, and God met with him here, and he built that altar. And let that be a lesson to you, son, that even in your darkest place, when you think God ain't there, he's there. Amen. And don't you ever forget that. <clears throat> he wasn't done with him yet. He had to show the Bethel. You know, we need to even... Uh, we never get too old or too wise or too experienced to, be, to need to be reminded of some things. I think God was reminding Elijah, but I think he was allowing him to relay that to Elisha. He had to take him to bed. But he still wasn't through with him yet. Look at verse 5. Verse 4. It says, and Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. He thinks he's going to Jericho to die now. He said, as the Lord lived, and I, as I saw that, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And of course the prophets there said the same thing. The Lord is going to take the mask from your head. And Elisha said, I know. You know, it's, they're all just discouraged about this thing. God wasn't, he wasn't through yet. He had to take him to Jericho. Anybody remember anything about Jericho? Yeah. Jericho was the most fortified city of that time. There in Joshua chapter 6. And God told the Israelites, he said, if you take your armies seven days and go around that fortified city and blow your trumpets, he said, I'll cause the walls to fall down flat and the city will be yours. Those walls were, they were eight feet thick and 30 feet high. He said, I'll, I'll knock them down for you. Sure enough, he did. That seventh day rolled around. They blew on that trumpet and the walls came falling down flat. I wonder if when Elijah and Elisha were walking through the, what was left of that old city and saying, you see that right there? That used to be the greatest city in the world. Really? What happened? Well, let me tell you about it. You see, the Israelites, they were going to conquer this city, but they couldn't do it by themselves. It was impossible. But God tore those walls down, and this is what's left of it. Let that be a lesson to you, Elisha. Even when things seem impossible, they may be impossible with man, but they're still possible with God. And he can, he can tear down the walls in your marriage. He can tear down He had, to show, he had to remind Elijah, but he had to relay it to Elijah. He wasn't through with him yet. He had to take him through Jericho. God, with all things, they're possible to God. They're not impossible to us. And God likes to work in the impossible situations in our life. You know, if we could do it, we would do it, wouldn't we? I mean, honestly... If I can do something, I'd probably just soon do it to ask him to do it for me. He'll put us in situations where we've we got to ask him to do it for us. We, we find out we can. He had to go through Jericho. You know, Jericho means a fragrant place. And it's been scientifically proven that your sense of smell is most closely tied to your memory. The certain smells bring back certain memories and places that you're in. He was reminiscing on the victories that God had won there at Jericho. And we need to remember the victories that God has wrought in our life. But even after Jericho, he still wasn't through it. Look in verse 6. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And
and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. So now they've gone, they've gone to Bethel, they've gone to Jericho, and now he comes to cross the Jordan uh, to go to the other side. He had to take him through Jordan, and you know that he, he smote that ground with his mantle, and the waters parted, and they were walking across on dry ground. And I, my mind went back to that time in Joshua chapter four. Look. The Israelites, God had delivered them out of Egypt. He had brought them through the wilderness for all those years. And then finally, as they were crossing the Jordan, they were coming to the end of their journey. They were going to Canaan land. That's why it, was, it, it comes time for somebody to die. You ever heard that old phrase, crossing the Jordan? That's, why they, that's where they get that from. The Israelites were nearing the end of their journey. And when they crossed that river, they were going to reach home, the place they had sought to be for so long. And when, they, when the Israelites finally made it across that river, what happened was, is the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their back. And when they went to walk across that river with that Ark, that waters, those waters parted that Jordan, they walked across on dry land. They got about halfway across, and Joshua says, Whoa, stop, stop. He said, Stand right there, guys. He said, You stand there the whole time these waters stay apart. He said, I, he said I, Here's what I want you to do. There's 12 tribes, 12 families, Israel. He said, I want, the, I want a man from every family. I want a man from every tribe. I want you to grab the biggest stone you can carry, and I want you to put him in the riverbed right here. So they put him one along, behind another. Twelve, Twelve big stones going across that riverbed. And he said, I want you to know, he said, these are going to be here for a memorial. And when your children ask you what these stones mean, he said, you tell them about the deliverance that God brought in Egypt. It'll be a reminder. It'll be a memorial. And I can see him. Can't you, can't you just see that? Can't you see the two prophets walking across that dry bed? And Elisha says, Oh, there's one of those stones right there. There's, there's 12 of them there. They're lined up. What, what are they doing in this room? That wasn't me. Well, let me tell you about it. The Israelites have finally reached their destination. They had reached the end of their journey. And Joshua told him to lay those stones down as a memorial of the deliverance that God wrought. And he told him, he said, your children are going to ask you what they mean. And you need to be at a place where you can tell them. And he said, let that be a lesson to you, Elisha. He said, when you reach the end of your journey, and it comes, it comes time for you to cross the Jordan, you better leave your kids with something more than how to play baseball. You better leave them with a little more than how to play football. You better leave with a little more than making good grades or singing competition. Or, I mean, we, we make competition out of everything now. Yeah. You better leave with something more than what this world has to offer. You better leave them with a godly heritage. And you better have some in your house when they see you reading that Bible and they see you going to church and they see you praying in your prayer closet at home and they see you having family devotions, they say, what means this? What does this mean? Amen. Well, let me tell you about it. July 4th of 1999, I was a sinner on my way to hell. And I heard about a man named Jesus. Amen. And that Jesus came and he died on the cross for my sins. But that wasn't the end. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And because he had power over death, we can have power over death. The Bible says, son, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means that none of us are good enough to make it heaven on our own. We better have something our children to look at and say, Amen. Dad, what's this mean? Mom, what's that mean? I mean, what do your kids see when they go home? Do they see an example, a godly example? You better leave your kids with a godly here because you only got one chance. Amen. He wasn't through with the last end of it about leaving a godly heritage. He, look, he didn't know about his time on the earth. He thought it was over. He said, oh, my life, is, my life is over. He thought his life was over. But not only was his life not over, his ministry wasn't even over. He had things he still had to do. He didn't know about his time on the earth. But the second thing is, I'm just now my second point. I won't get too long, I promise. I better not promise. The second thing Elijah didn't know, he didn't know about this triumphant exit. 
Look at verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it should not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and part of them both was sunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And so... He had a triumphant exit. You know, and I know that I know that Elijah couldn't have known how God was going to take him because if he had, he wouldn't have said, Elijah, stay here. He said, come on, boy, you want to see this. He didn't know how God was going to take him. You know, he, he never really died. God just took him. Yeah. You know, for the Christian, we never really die. God just takes us. Right. We don't, look, I, I, he tasted death for every man. I don't have to worry about it. Brother Ryan was preaching in the hospital. Imagine that. He was telling Dakota, he said, he said, you know, Dakota, as Christians, we never really die. God just takes us. Ain't that something? I mean, we're just going to pass from this life to the next one. That body laying in that casket is going to be an empty shell. That's right. Hallelujah. had a friend of mine, his papa passed away, and he suffered for a long time. I mean, terrible suffering. And when he died, you know, he was saying, you good man. When he died, you know what we were doing yesterday? I know, I know people think I'm crazy. I know people think that I'm just insensitive. But we were standing probably six feet away from that casket and that body laying there. We was laughing and cutting up like ain't nothing was wrong. Because you know what? He ain't hurt no more. Right. Hey, we couldn't, we couldn't make him come back if we wanted to. We couldn't talk him into it. That's right. Hey, that body's nothing but an empty shell. Right. He's got a new body now. I mean, I'm not going to act. I mean, hey, it's a, it's a, hey, look, they're going to miss him, but hey, it's a celebration. It's a going home party. Amen. Uh, it's not that way at Lost First Funeral. That's right. It's night and day. Night and day. Everybody looking at him, wondering at this, where he's at. You die today, what will people think or say about you? You lay in that casket. Boy, he sure did love the Lord. Boy, he's, he's shouting down. Running down the street with coal right now. God's new mansion. He's, he's there singing with Jesus, or would it be man? He was a pretty good guy. I hope so. Do you have a hope so salvation, or do you have a no so? You see, Elijah, he had a triumphant exit. God just took him. And let me say this of all the things that Elijah had done, of all the things that God had done through Elijah, all those miracles. See, Elijah thought his life was over, but he still had one thing left to do. And it would be greater than anything he'd done before. And that was that chariot of fire experience. He never died. And because of that, Elijah got to see God in a way he'd never seen him before. As I'm going to get into. But he, had, he had a triumphant exit. He had nothing to worry about. Elijah didn't. We're saved. We have nothing to worry about. Hey, if I, I'll tell you what right now, if I'm on my deathbed and I know my time's coming, I'm not saying go away, I'm saying y'all get in here. Y'all, I want you to be here when I cross the Jordan. I want you to see this. Hey, I think it was, I believe it was Miss Vicky's father. When he was, when he was dying, <laughs> I mean, he was, he was gone. He sat up in bed and said, man, wouldn't you like to have a house like that? What a foundation. Hallelujah. I want them to be there. We're going to have a triumph for this. But lastly, not only did he have a triumph for this, but he had a tremendous impact, and he had no idea what that impact would be. Look at verse 9 again. Of course, Elijah, he, he asked for a double portion. See, Elijah didn't, Elijah didn't know what he would ask, and then he didn't know if God would grant it. But one thing that Elijah had to be worried about as he was nearing the end of his journey is his ministry. I have no doubt about that. He had these other prophets. I call them false prophets. They didn't want in on what was going on. They, they were standing afar off. They didn't want to get in on what was going on. They just wanted to spectate. And I know Elijah didn't want to leave his ministry.
to one of those guys. And he was worried about what would become of his ministry. And here Elisha comes. He didn't know what he asked for, but he said, I, I want to build a portion of God's spirit to you. I'm sure that made his day to hear that. But look at what God did. Verse 12. Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them into pieces. He took also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back. I like that term. He went back. And he stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And he smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. So see, he's asked for a double portion of his spirit. And when Elijah was taken up, he, his mantle fell down and Elisha took it. And he went back the same way that he had come from. And he got to the, the River Jordan. I'm sure he was looking at it. And he's thinking to himself, I, I wonder if this is going to work like it worked for Elijah. But he did the right thing. He looked in the right place and he said, where is the God of Elijah? And those waters parted just like they had before. And you know why? Because of all the things that God had done for Elijah, all the miracles, all the wonders. It, the, power, the power was never in a man. It wasn't in a man. It was in the master. Amen. And he went back, even though that man of God had gone up, he went back and the waters parted for him just like they had for Elijah. Amen. And I'm telling you what, God will part the waters for us just like he has in the past. And Brother Ronnie, I have no doubt about that. Ooh, and hey, you know what we need to do though? We need to be like Elijah. We need to follow him. Wherever he goes. And we don't need to let him get down. We don't need to let him separate himself from those that he loves. And it'll happen. It can happen to him. It can happen to any one of us when we get down. That's right. You follow. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. God's going to bring us to the Amen. God's going to bring us by Jericho. God's going to bring us across the Jordan. And just like Elijah, we're going to see God in a way that we've never seen him before. And we're going to say, my God, my God. My Father, my Father. That's what Elisha said. And it's going to have an impact on us. It's going to have an impact on the community. And as you'll see, when Elisha, when Elisha crossed back across the Jordan, there's those prophets that refused to follow him. And they recognized the Spirit of God on him. And in their ignorance, they bowed down and worship. God's going to do something amazing. Amen. We need to follow God's Word. We need to follow God's man. And we need to be sensitive to him during this time. And you're going to be amazed at what he's going to do. Amen. Would you stand? <coughs> Maybe you're here this morning and you say, I don't even know if I'm saved. I don't know if I had died, if I would be in heaven or not. If you're not sure, if you're not certain on every head bowed on every eye closed. If you're here this morning and you're lost, you don't know if you're saved. You don't know if you would go to heaven if you were to die. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you. I just want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand and say, I don't know, Brother Brandon. I'd just like you to pray for me. I don't know if I'm saved. Would you raise your hand this morning before God and say, I don't know, but I'd like to. Would you pray for me? Maybe this morning... You say, I know I'm saved, but perhaps I haven't laid out those stones. I haven't laid out a memorial for my children. But I want to be the godly example that I need to be. So raise your hand. I look my hands up. I want to be a godly example for my kids. Maybe today you just got a bird on your heart. Why don't you cast it down at his feet? Casting all your care upon him for care of you. Would you come? Joe, you got something to play with
not grieve the Spirit of God. But to count it gain would be my loss if I lay down. You're not saved once you make that first step, and God will be there. Nobody's going to embarrass you or celebrate with joy. You'd be set free today. Thank you. That's in Jesus. 